Welcome back to the second part of the Great Resurrection Debate here at Bethel College in South Bend, Indiana, between Bishop John Shelby Spong and Dr. William Craig. I would like to emphasize uh, before we go any further that neither of these two speakers is representing any particular organization. This is a debate between two individuals who have spoken um, in many venues on this topic, so please don't associate their views with any particular organization that you may have in mind. What we'd like to do now is to welcome back our two main speakers, Dr. Craig and Bishop Spong, for what you might call a rebuttal of a rebuttal. Uh, this gives them a chance to respond to what was criticized in their initial um, presentations by the other speaker. And we will start, in that case, with Dr. Craig. You'll recall that the first step of the positive case I offered for the resurrection of Jesus as an historical event was that the majority of New Testament critics today uh, accept the historicity of the empty tomb, the post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection. And I described the revolution that has taken place in resurrection studies over the last half century. Bishop Spong says, well, this is a politician's trick, uh, just trying to say that most scholars agree with you when, in fact, they do not. Now, I will say that I did say that deliberately and uh, on purpose. And the reason I did is because over and over again, as I prepared for this debate in Dr. Spong's books, I found him assuring his readers that no scholar takes these resurrection narratives literally, that most scholars think that the empty tomb is an unhistorical legend, that few scholars think that Jesus appeared physically alive from the dead. And as a person who has done his doctorate in the resurrection at the University of Munich, I knew that these statements were false. I know the literature. And I knew that these uh, statements were misleading his readers. And so I wanted deliberately to communicate to you today that uh, when Dr. Spong says, for example, no scholar he knows of thinks that the Gospels are biographies, no scholar he knows of dates the book of Acts earlier than AD 62, with all due respect, he's simply out of touch with contemporary scholarship. Take the question of the Gospels being biographies. Graham Stanton, British New Testament scholar, says 20 years ago, only a few scholars dared to challenge the belief that the Gospels were unique in literary genre. But he says Burridge's book, Richard Burridge's book, What Are the Gospels, turned the tide of scholarly opinion. So that today scholars do recognize these are of a biographical genre. They're not mythology. They're not myth. They're not midrash. They're a historical form of writing, and I think accurate ones at that. Michael Goulder, whom he cites, is one of the most radical and isolated maverick New Testament critics on the scene today. Hardly anybody agrees with Goulder's views, whereas the majority do accept that the Gospels are of the genre of biography. Also with regard to the resurrection, my colleague Gary Habermas has recently completed a survey of over 1,400 articles published over the last 25 years on the resurrection. And his survey showed that 75% of scholars who have dealt with the subject argued in favor of the historicity of the empty tomb, and there was nearly universal agreement concerning the appearances and the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection. So these are indeed uh, facts that are recognized by the majority of scholars today. Now, Dr. Spong says, but it's not multiply and independently attested, as you claim, because the Gospels have Mark as their only primary source. Not at all. As I argued, the non mathean vocabulary in the Gospel of Matthew shows that Matthew is using an additional source besides Mark. John is independent of Mark, so that's an additional source. Luke and John both have the story of the disciples, Peter and John, visiting the tomb, so they don't get that from Mark, and they're independent of each other, so that's traditional. I mentioned the sermons in the book of Acts, which mentioned the empty tomb. So the empty tomb is abundantly attested uh, by multiple and independent sources, one of the most important criteria for historicity. He says, but there was a period of 40 years of tradition. Well, I, I don't think that's true in the first place. Scholars like Bo Reiki, uh, Donald Guthrie, Colin Hemer all date the book of Acts prior to AD 62. But even given his late dating, remember what Sherwin White said. 
Even two generations is too short a time span to allow legendary tendencies to wipe out the hard core of historical facts. There may be discrepancies in the circumstantial aspects of the narratives, but on the core, as I showed you, they are remarkably harmonious and unified. And remember, we're not talking about a 40-year gap. Mark's source for the passion goes back to within seven years of the crucifixion. Paul's information in 1 Corinthians 15 goes back to within five years of the crucifixion. This makes the window of opportunity for the cruel, accrual of legend to be virtually impossible. So I think we have good grounds for affirming these facts. Now, the real question then is, what is the best explanation of these facts? Well, Bishop Spong defends, in his view, what I call the simple Simon theory of the resurrection. The basic idea of this theory is that the doctrine of the resurrection came about because Simon Peter couldn't explain properly the new understanding of Jesus' crucifixion that he had come to. According to Dr. Spong's theory, after Jesus' death, Simon went back to Galilee, where he struggled for months to understand Jesus' crucifixion. And finally, he came to see, in Bishop Spong's words, that, quote, the crucifixion was the final episode in the story of Jesus' life. It demonstrated that it is in giving life away that we find life, that it is in giving love away that we find love. Simon came to understand that God had taken the life of Jesus into the divine nature and that this life, now part of God, was available to them forever. But Simon was at a loss to explain his new insight to his fellow disciples. So he described it to them as, quote, unquote, Jesus' resurrection, even though he knew Jesus hadn't literally risen from the dead. And the others came to share Simon's insight and adopted his manner of speaking. So the bottom line is that the doctrine of the resurrection is the result of simple Simon's inability to express himself clearly. Now, What's funny about this theory is that even at face value, it doesn't even try to explain many of the phenomena that Bishop Spong himself said required explaining, such as the transformation of Jesus' family, like James and Jesus' brothers, the shift from Sabbath worship to Sunday worship, or the conversion of hostile Jewish leaders like Saul of Tarsus. So even at face value, the theory doesn't work. But even more importantly, the theory doesn't explain even what it sets out to explain, namely the origin of the disciples' belief in Jesus' resurrection. As N.T. Wright points out, Judaism had plenty of ways for talking about divine forgiveness, but declaring one's recently executed leader to be Messiah, or that he had in any sense been raised from the dead, was not one of them. On Bishop Spong's view, Wright says, there really was no early belief in resurrection at all since the word resurrection was never used to denote a non-bodily extension of life in a heavenly realm, however glorious. Spong, he says, has to postulate that at some point, someone began to use to denote this belief language which had never meant that before and continued not to mean it in either paganism, Judaism, or Christianity, and that other people who knew that resurrection meant bodies nevertheless went along with this usage. We might add to Wright's critique that uh, using such misleading resurrection language to express the new meaning of the crucifixion would have been utterly counterproductive in winning Gentile or Jewish converts, because both of them denied that historical resurrections ever occur within history. Add to this the fact that the theory offers nothing to explain the empty tomb and the resurrection appearances, and you find that really the theory doesn't explain anything. It's just not big and powerful enough. The simple Simon theory is just too simplistic. I think when you compare the evidence, the earliest disciples gave the right explanation when they said that God has raised him from the dead. Thank you, Dr. Cray. Bishop Spong. Well, I must say that that time, Bill, I didn't recognize myself in your recreation of me. I think resurrection is so much bigger than your caricaturing of it. Let me say just a couple of things, and then I'd like to illustrate the point. It doesn't do a lot of good for me to say scholars support me and for him to say scholars support him. We need to say, who are these scholars? I'm quite willing to admit that the great majority of evangelical scholars will support Bill Craig's point of view. 
But I'd also like you to know that in the world of academia, not one of them has significant standing. And in the world of scholarship that I work in, which would be the Jesus Seminar people, they would dismiss them out of hand as scholars. But we can debate who's a scholar and who's not a scholar. I have no desire to try to, to convert Dr. Craig to my point of view. My only point of, my only reason for being in this debate is because I think there are a lot of people that live in my century that are turned off by the literal symbols surrounding the Christian story. And I want to offer them a way into the experience of the Christian story where they don't have to trip over the literalized first century symbols. One final minor thing is that if Mark's source, if Mark writes the earliest passion story, then I'd like to ask why he overwhelmingly shapes that story by references to the Old Testament, basically to Psalm 22 and to Isaiah 53. I'd like to spend most of my time, I'm tired of rebutting rebuttals of rebuttals. I'd like to, to, to press on in a, in a more positive direction. A friend of mine, before he died, was named Carl Sagan. He was a great American astrophysicist. Carl Sagan was a fascinating man. He was Jewish by his ethnic background. He was a militant atheist by his religious persuasion. But he was a funny kind of atheist. He's the kind of atheist that seemed to talk about God all the time. I called him a God-intoxicated atheist. He also enjoyed puncturing the simplistic mindset of people who literalized all religious stories. We were on a conference staff together in Washington, D.C., two years before he died. And he saw me, and he came bounding across the room, and he said, Jack, have you ever thought of what the ascension of Jesus looks like to an astrophysicist? I said, no, Carl, I haven't thought about that a great deal, but I knew I was going to have to. Now, just for background, let me tell you that the ascension story comes into the Christian tradition in the writings of Luke. There's a reference to it in the 24th chapter of his gospel. But the biggest story is in the first chapter of the book of Acts. And I would date that well into the ninth decade, maybe even into the tenth decade. So before that, you don't have an ascension story. Indeed, I think I could argue that Paul saw resurrection and ascension as part of the same thing, because I think he saw the resurrection as God having raised Jesus into the presence of the living God, out of whom he appeared to certain chosen witnesses, including Paul who says that what he saw was no different from what anybody else saw. And I don't know anybody that thinks Paul saw a physically resuscitated body. He saw some vision of God that transformed his life. But in any event, Carl began to talk. We live in a space age. He said, do you know that if Jesus literally ascended into the sky, and if he traveled at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, he hasn't yet escaped our galaxy. And then in his Sagan-esque way, he said, and our galaxy is one of billions and billions and billions of galaxies. I thought he was going to have a religious experience. <laughs> but you see, Carl Sagan is right. We can't literalize that story and have it make sense to people who live in a space age. We know that the universe that we live in is enormous. It would take light traveling at the speed of light, which travels at 186,000 miles per second, about, would take over 100,000 years to go from one end of our galaxy to the other. And our galaxy is only one of billions of galaxies in the visible universe. So we have to think in a whole different frame of reference. But you see, I don't believe that the author of Luke Acts, whoever he was, I don't think he meant to tell a literal story. I think he was preaching a sermon, trying to help people understand the meaning of Jesus. And I suspect his text was the story of the ascension of Elijah that's told in the Old Testament. Now, if you go back and read that story, you will discover that Elijah walks out with his single disciple, Elisha, to this rendezvous point, and everybody knows that Elijah is going to depart this world. And so Elisha comes up to him and he says, Master, I'd like a final deathbed request. What is it, my son? Well, if I'm going to be your successor as the prophet of Israel, 
I want to be endowed with a double portion of your spirit. And Elijah said, I don't know that I can give you that. But if you see me ascending into the sky, then you will know that your request has been granted. And then at that moment, out of the sky, according to this wonderful story, comes a fiery chariot drawn by magical fiery horses. Is that literal? But that, that chariot comes out of the sky and it stops right down there across the Jordan River where Elijah and Elisha are waiting, just like it's a regular stop on a regular bus route. And Elijah hops on, says farewell, and then even the ancient people knew that a chariot couldn't go up into the sky defying gravity, which they didn't know anything about. And so we're told that there's a whirlwind that comes behind that chariot. Magical horses driving a magical chariot and propelled by a whirlwind. And Elijah goes up into the sky and Elisha sees. And so Elisha, Elijah, Elisha knows that he will receive a double portion of Elijah's spirit. Luke was trying to tell us that Jesus was a new and greater Elijah. He was trying to tell us that even when you take the greatest life that we've had in our Jewish tradition, it isn't big enough to capture what we believe we have experienced in the God presence in Jesus of Nazareth. And so he takes that Elijah story and he magnifies it to the tenth power to try to make it big enough to capture the experience. Jesus goes up into heaven without any props. He doesn't need chariots. He doesn't need horses. He doesn't need a whirlwind. And all Elijah can do is give a double portion of his enormous but still human spirit to his single disciple. Luke says this Christ figure in whom we have met God in this dramatic new way can give the infinite power of God's Holy Spirit that will last through all the ages a new and greater Elijah. And then we know that he's, we know he's using this Elijah story because he takes the fire from the chariots and the fiery horses and he makes it the tongues of fire that light upon the disciples' heads at the time of Pentecost. And then he takes that whirlwind and he turns it into the mighty rushing wind of the Spirit, the Ruach of God, that fills the room where they were. The story can be transformed. It can still be powerfully true because language has to struggle to capture the essence of God. You do not diminish the story by expanding the language and saying, this is the best we human beings can do to capture the infinite and living presence of God. Thank you very much, Bishop Spong. Would uh, both gentlemen please come to the podiums right now? We are going to have a, a question and answer period. These are questions that have been written by members of the audience and members of the television audience. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of the debaters a question that was specifically addressed to that person and the other debater will have an opportunity to give his own comment on that. The first question is to Dr. William Craig. The question is, why must one take the resurrection of Jesus as a literal historical event? Cannot one be a Christian and regard the whole thing merely as a metaphor? My argument is that the resurrection of Jesus was a real historical event. So I'm not arguing that one, what one has to do. I'm simply arguing for the truth of the position that when you look at the historical evidence, you have very good grounds for thinking this, this literally did happen. So I'm not making any verdicts tonight or judgments about who and who is, is not a Christian. That's beside the point for my interest as a historian. My interest as a historian is did this event actually occur and I think that there are quite good grounds for thinking that it occurred both the, in, in the facts that I've explained and then in assessing what is the best explanation of those facts so I'm not interested in making judgments as I explained in my uh, second speech the earliest Christians took this as a literal uh, event uh, not as a metaphor that's the way they thought of it and the question is were they right or were they wrong that's that's the question I'm interested in thank you very much Bishop Spong. With regard all of that language is just inadequate language uh, I think the event is real I think there's enormous power I think the resurrection is a God experience I don't believe human language can ever capture the essence of that God experience and so all I'm arguing for is a, to find a way that we today can continue to walk into that experience Thank you, Mr. Spong. I have a question for you, sir. 
Um, and I'm going to rephrase it in, I think, language that perhaps most best articulates the question, uh, the question's intent. You would agree that something did happen on that resurrection morning. Yes. And yet you dispute whether literally a human cadaver that was dead came alive and was seen then by various disciples. So if the physical reconstitution of the human body did not take place, what event does the resurrection actually signify? I don't think the resurrection has a thing to do with the body. I think the resurrection was an experience where the disciples' eyes were open to see the reality of God who is around us at all times, but we are unable to see it. And they saw Jesus as a part of that reality. And they stepped into that vision and they experienced the resurrecting power that was present in him. Uh, the idea that it was a body that walked out of the, out of the tomb uh, is, is not even an appealing idea to me. Uh, I don't need for it to be physical. I find it rather amazing that religious people who talk about the life of the spirit discover that the spiritual things have no meaning unless they can be attached to physical symbols. And I'd like to suggest that spiritual is a word a lot bigger than that and, and one we ought not to diminish by, by sort of hacking at it because it's not attached to some sort of physical resuscitation. The idea that that God would reverse the life process uh, and do billions of individual miracles to bring back a, a body that had been dead for three days, it strikes me as to make God a kind of miracle worker. Dr. Craig. Well, as I said, it does depend on whether or not you believe in the existence of a personal God who is able to do miracles. If you don't believe that that sort of a being exists, you will not be open to the resurrection of Jesus as an actual event. But if there is a creator and designer of the universe who is distinct from the world, then clearly he would have the power to raise someone from the dead, particularly his son, as a vindication of the radical uh, messianic claims that he made uh, and for which he was crucified. But where I disagree most with Bishop Spong is when he says it's not appealing to him, that he doesn't need it to be physical. You can't determine the truth by what appeals to you. The truth is objective in and of itself whether you find it appealing or not. And I think we have to be very, very careful lest we use our own sentiments to shape what we think reality is because what happens then is you begin to create God in your own image and you begin to, to make him over after the way you want him to be. And I think that's, that's well, it's really idolatry in a sense. Okay, thank you. This is a question to both of you, but I will pose it first to Dr. Craig. What should one understand from Jesus' own words about his resurrection before he died? Could, could you be more specific? What words do you have in mind? Well, he spoke, I think, about uh, his being resurrected in some form or other in the New Testament accounts. Yeah. Well, if you're asking me as a historian, I would say that we have very good grounds for thinking that Jesus understood his impending death uh, he had seen John the Baptist uh, killed. He knew what had happened to him. He understood the tension that was in the air. He understood that by going around uh, claiming to be uh, the Messiah, that he was putting himself in harm's way. So I think Jesus had a very clear premonition of what was going to happen to him. And I think that he foresaw his vindication as well. He uh, didn't think that God would leave his righteous servant uh, abandoned forever, that God would vindicate him. And so I think this, it's quite good grounds for thinking that Jesus uh, foresaw what would happen to him, that he even provoked it by his triumphal entry into Jerusalem in fulfillment of Zechariah's prophecies, and that he embraced it willingly. So I don't think this was some sort of an accident that overtook Jesus of Nazareth, but it was something that he deliberately uh, embraced. Thank you. Dr. Spong. Archbishop Spong. I'm not Archbishop, thank heaven. <laughs> I, don't think it, I don't think it's very important to us to try to get into the mind of Jesus and try to determine what he understood. That's difficult enough just with the Gospels because part of the difficulty we have is did Jesus really say this or did the Christian community put these words into Jesus' mouth? Uh, I can't imagine Jesus saying, I am the bread of life, for example, but I think he is the bread of life because he feeds me 
in an eternal way. I don't think he said, I am the vine, you are the branches, but he is the source through which the life of God flows to me, so I understand that analogy. Uh, a lot of things in the New Testament, I think, are put into the mind of Jesus by the Christian church, meditating upon the meaning that they experience from him. So I don't find it terribly edifying to try to, to spend much of our time figuring out what the mind of Jesus was, because all we have is the mind of Jesus filtered through the life of the church and through these four gospel writers. Thank you. Uh, a question to Bishop Spong. Um, it seems from the language of 1 Corinthians 15 that Paul himself believed in a physical resurrection as having taken place. How would you account for that? Well, I would disagree with that. Uh, I don't think that idea even occurred to Paul. He spends a lot of time trying to understand uh, what a body is, and he winds up with all sorts of new analogies. He says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. But let's look at the people that he lists in that list of those who have seen the Lord. Uh, he says, first of all, to Peter, Cephas, and then to the twelve. That's a fascinating reference because presumably Judas Iscariot is still among them. They don't elect Matthias to replace Judas until the book of Acts, which is some 40 years later. And then he says to 500 brethren at once, and no gospel makes any attempt to try to authenticate that. There are some people that try to make that be the Pentecost experience, but I think that's a very long stretch. And then he says to James, and there's a real debate as to what James that is, and there are three candidates, James the son of Alphaeus, James the son of Zebedee, and James the brother of Jesus. And I would say that the weight of New Testament scholarship would identify that as James the brother of Jesus. And then he says to the apostles, now who are they? He's already listed the twelve. This seems to be a new group, or these apostles aren't the same as the disciples. And then in the most telling way, he says, he appeared to me. I think it is terribly important that we recognize that the earliest witness to the resurrection, which is Paul, says that his experience was no different from that of any of the others except that his was last. And Adolf Harnack, a great historian of the Christian church in the 19th century, dated the conversion of Paul from one to six years after the crucifixion. I don't know of anybody that's challenged that, but you may know of someone who has. But anyway, if it's one to six years afterwards, and Paul says what he experienced was the same as what everybody else experienced, then it can hardly be a resuscitated body that walked out of a grave. Bishop Spong, I'm sorry, I must ask you to curtail that, that answer. Uh, and please, in our remaining uh, Two minutes, please be as concise with the time factor as you can be. Um, a question for Dr. Cray. Do I not get a counter response? Uh, yes, you do. Okay. I'm sorry. I think it's very clear that Paul believed in a physical resurrection. Um, when he uh, describes what kind of body they, the resurrected will have, he says that it is sown a perishable body, it is raised as a an imperishable body. It is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness, it is raised in power. It is sown in natural body, it is raised a spiritual or supernatural body. There is historical continuity between the body that is sown and the body that is raised. So there is no doubt in my mind that when Paul said he was buried and he was raised, Paul assumed that there was an empty tomb left behind, that this was a physical resurrection. Again, he uses the uh, demonstrative word this, this perishable must put on the imperishable, this corruptible must put on incorruption. Uh, when he says flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, flesh and blood is a Semitic idiom meaning people, uh, frail human nature as when he says in Galatians that when he was converted I did not confer with flesh and blood but I went away into Arabia. And what he means is what he says in the second half of the verse, the corruptible cannot put on incorruption, it must therefore be transformed. Thank you very much, Dr. Craig, and we have time for one more question, and I'm going to take the privilege of being moderated to pose my own question. Um, Bishop Spong, um, you would certainly, reading, listening to your uh, comments in this debate, uh, clearly you think something happened, uh, a religious experience, if we can use the generic term. Do you think the experience of the disciples of Jesus on the resurrection morning was unique to Christianity or was it a religious experience that might be common to many other religions in the world today? 
I have no idea. I only know that we receive it as unique within the Christian tradition. But I long ago stopped telling God what God is able to do with other people. For me, uh, it is a uniquely Christian experience, and I want to walk through the Christ path into the, into the presence of the living God, uh, because that's the reality. Uh, my problem with the way you phrase the question and with a lot of the debate is that my problem is that I don't have a language big enough to tell you what I believe the resurrection is. And that's difficult. And I can't use the language of the tradition because it no longer communicates in the world in which I live. And I'm, but I'm so convinced of the reality of the experience that I keep looking for a way that we can open that experience into, into the common mind of people and have them walk into it. You see, the resurrection doesn't mean anything if it was just an event 2,000 years ago. It's got to be an eternal event which continues to resurrect in every generation. So I don't want to bind it in time with physical symbols. Thank you very much, Bishop Spong. Dr. Craig. Well, I certainly agree that it must continue on in time, but it can't continue on in time unless it had a beginning, if, unless there was a seminal event at the root. And this gets back to the, the, the simple Simon theory, as I call it. Uh, Bishop Spong, and I quoted him, says that Simon came to see that it is in giving love away that we find love, in giving life away we find life. And that's an insight that is not unique to Christianity, clearly. It's, it's a true insight, but it's hardly unique to the Christian faith. And it is hardly expressed by saying he is risen from the dead, which, as uh, N.T. Wright said, had never been used in antiquity in that sort of way. It always, in paganism, Judaism, and Christianity, referred to a physical bodily resurrection from the dead. So I don't think that Bishop Spong has really come to grips with his own work, which is very fine, on this incredible transformation that occurred. He's still left with that big gaping hole in the middle of first century that begs to be filled by the resurrection itself. Dr. Craig, thank you very much. And that, unfortunately, concludes our uh, general question time. Uh, we now have five minutes for each of the debaters to make a closing statement. And um, I ask Dr. Mr. Bishop Spong to sit down and Dr. Craig to start. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Well, in my closing statement, I'd like to draw together some of the threads of this debate and see what conclusions we can reach. I've maintained tonight that the resurrection was a real historical event. We saw that the majority of scholars today, and I mean first-rate scholars, agree on the essential facts to be explained. By contrast, Bishop Spong denies all three of these facts. He rejects the women's discovery of Jesus' empty tomb. He denies that the disciples saw appearances of Jesus. And he even denies that the original disciples believed in Jesus' resurrection at all, as that word is properly defined. Ironically, then, this places his views further outside of mainstream scholarship than the views of the fundamentalists that he so scornfully speaks of in his writings. Moreover, I think we saw that if you're open to the existence of God, then it's pretty hard to deny that the best explanation of the facts is that God raised Jesus from the dead. And again, sadly, this explanation, which is the one given by the original eyewitnesses, isn't available to Bishop Spawn because he doesn't believe in the existence of a personal God distinct from the universe who is the creator of the world. And so he's forced to these desperate expedients like the simple Simon theory, uh, which postulates a cause that is neither big enough nor powerful enough to explain the facts and which is therefore convinced almost, well, I think virtually no one, uh, certainly no scholar. Now, if I'm right that the resurrection of Jesus really did happen, then I think this has enormous implications for today. It means that Jesus is not just some person in the dusty pages of ancient history or a symbolic figure on a stained glass window. Rather, he is alive and can be known today. Moreover, as the conqueror of death, he holds the key that unlocks the door to eternal life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live, and he who lives and believes in me shall never die. I think it's one of the tragedies of our day that millions of people in mainline Protestant denominations have been denied the opportunity of such a personal relationship with Christ because their churches have been derouted by liberal theology which replaced the risen Christ with myths 
and symbols. Instead of the gospel, the laity are fed a blasé diet of humanism and moralistic sermonizing. And as a result, their hearts are left empty and craving for spiritual reality. I know. I've been there. You see, I wasn't raised in a church going home myself. But when I became a teenager, I began to ask the big questions in life. And in the search for answers, I began to attend a church in our community. Unfortunately, it was a, a, a liberal church, which no longer preached the gospel that Christ died for our sins and was raised for our redemption. As one lay leader confided privately to me, it was just a social country club where the dues were a dollar a week in the offering plate. And I found no answers there, nothing to fill the spiritual void that was in my soul. And then one day I walked into my German class and I sat down behind a girl who's one of these types, you know, that is always so happy, it just makes you sick. And I tapped her on the shoulder and she turned around and I said, Sandy, what are you always so happy about anyway? And she said, well, Bill, it's because I know Jesus Christ is my personal Savior. And I said, well, I go to church. And she said, that's not enough, Bill. You've got to have him really living in your heart. And I said, well, what would he want to do a thing like that for? And she said, because he loves you, Bill. And that just hit me like a ton of bricks. Here I was so filled with despair and emptiness. And she said that there was someone who really loved me. And who was it but the God of the universe? And that thought staggered me to think that the God of the universe could love that worm, Bill Craig, down there on that speck of dust called planet Earth. I began to read the New Testament, and as I did so, I was captivated by the person of Jesus of Nazareth. His words had the ring of truth about them, and there was an authenticity about his life that wasn't characteristic of these people who claimed to be his followers in the church I was going to. And I realized I couldn't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Well, after a period of about six months of the most intense soul-searching, I just came to the end of myself and cried out to God. And I felt this tremendous infusion of joy, like a balloon being blown up and blown up until it was ready to burst. I rushed outside. It was a warm Midwestern summer night. I could see the Milky Way from horizon to horizon. And I thought, God, I've come to know God. And that moment changed my whole life. You see, I thought enough about this message to realize if it were really the truth, if it were really the truth, then I could do nothing less than devote my entire life to spreading this message among mankind. And so if you're in the situation I was in, I'd invite you to do the same thing I did. Pick up the New Testament, begin to read it, and ask yourself, could this really be the truth? I believe that it could change your life in the way that it changed mine. Dr. Craig, thank you. Bishop Spong. Bill, I rejoice in your conversion experience. I'm, I'm sorry that you decided to define my understanding of God, and I think you did it very inadequately. But I also re was raised in that kind of church, the kind that spoke to you, and it didn't speak to me. Maybe that says people are different. In the early part of the 20th century, a group of evangelical Christians published a series of tracts that they called the Fundamentals. This was their attempt in the light of the great advances over the last 600 years from Copernicus to Einstein and perhaps far beyond that, which had eroded and shattered certain religious convictions. And they wanted to strike back. They wanted to find out what were the irreducible fundamental beliefs of the Christian faith. And one of them, they said, was the physical, bodily, corpuscular nature of the resurrected body of Jesus. I think they confused the fundamental and foundational experience of the Christian faith and its power with a human explanation of that experience. I agree that the reality of the resurrection is fundamental to Christianity. I do not think that the first century explanations of that reality is fundamental to Christian belief. I'd like to close this by by going into something with which I close almost every lecture I give. I cannot tell you who God is. I cannot tell you what God is. No human being can do that. That's beyond the human capacity. All I can tell you is how I believe I have experienced God. That's why I was happy to hear Bill tell us how he has experienced God. Well, I've experienced God too. But I've experienced God as the source of life. And if God is the source of life, the only way I can worship this God is by living fully. And the more fully I live, the more I bear witness to this God of life. 
And I've experienced God as the source of love. And if God is the source of love, then the only way I can worship this God is by loving wastefully. And the more deeply and wastefully I love, the more I make this God visible. And thirdly, I experience God in the words of my great teacher, Paul Tillich, as the ground of all being. It's a cumbersome phrase. But if God is the ground of all being, I worship God by having the courage to be all that I am capable of being. And the more deeply and fully I can be who I am, then I make God visible. And to that I add this line, crucial to me, I am a Christian. By that I mean that when I look at Jesus, I see a life so totally lived that I believe I see in him the very source of life. I see a life that's so wastefully loved that I believe I see in him the source of love. I see one who has the courage to be all that he can be, whether he's being hailed as the king at Palm Sunday or crucified on Good Friday. He still is all that he can be, and so he bears witness to me of the ground of all being. And I want to be a disciple of that Jesus. But how do I follow Christ? It's not by trying to convert people to my point of view. I long ago gave that up. I follow Christ by trying to build a world where everybody in that world has a better chance to live more fully, to love more wastefully, and to be all that they can be in the infinite variety of our humanity. Male and female, black and white, Asian, gay and straight, every kind, left-handed, right-handed, every kind of person. The call of the Christian church is to free the people of this world to be all that they can be, and the power for doing that is in the Christ figure and in the meaning of his resurrection. That, to me, is the essence of the Christian gospel, and it is upon that gospel that I stand, upon that gospel I live, and by that gospel I will die. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bishop Spong. And it remains only for me to conclude this evening by thanking Bethel College here at South Bend, Indiana, and the Church Communication Network for hosting us also. We've heard two very gifted and eloquent speakers tonight. I'm sure they've raised, each of them, very profound questions that we will consider in the next few minutes and weeks and months and years. And I would like you at this point to present your appreciation of our two debaters tonight, Bishop Spong and Dr. Craig. Thank you.